All right. Um, we are going to start doing two things today. Um, we are going to um, look at updates and deletes. That counts as one thing. <laughs> All right. Although I guess that's two things. So we're going to look at updates and deletes. And we're going to look about how we can use the classes in the framework to do inserts, updates, and deletes. Um, so far, we have used those classes, but we've coded it ourselves. We're going to sort of do inserts, updates, and deletes using sort of the default pre-built functionality. All right? The easy way. All right? So the inserts that we've done so far, we've sort of done them the hard way. Uh, we're going to do it now the easy way um, by using the default behavior of the classes in the framework. But first, we're going to review update and delete statements. Um, in addition to that, this week, I think Thursday, is do the design for your project. So that's sort of job one this week is to get a good design down so that we can look at it and go forward and you know what you're doing. Now again, some of the things you may not know how to do. And most of the things, uh, most of the queries, you know, we've covered how to do queries. Uh, we've covered how to do inserts. Updates and deletes will get done over the next few days. So really most of the stuff, if we didn't cover it already, sort of have faith that we will have covered it pretty soon. If there is something really unusual about your project where you're doing something that may be out of the ordinary, um, we can discuss that individually if there's something you're really not sure. But if you were to tell me, and I've had students say this and I can understand it, like, well, we haven't talked about updating yet, so how can I design an update? Well, you can have pretty well guess what a screen would look like that will allow you to update, right? You're going to have <coughs> text boxes on them and you're going to have, uh, you know, validators on them and when they press a button, a SQL statement is going to run. So, okay, you may not know the details of exactly how to do that, but you could pretty well guess sort of what that's going to look like. So, you know enough to design it and say, I will have a page that will allow me to enter new categories for films or whatever. All right. So, let's talk about the update uh, and delete. Uh, if you have any questions at all about your project, feel free to email me. Feel free to email me a rough draft of the project. Uh, and if you have problems with any labs, feel free to contact me about those. All right. Updates and deletes are like inserts in that they only work on one table at a time. They also are subject to similar sorts of reasons for failing. If you remember, we talked about reasons why a insert statement would fail. One of them was it violates constraints that we build in the database. So we try to insert uh, a row into the table that's missing information that's required. That would be one example. Well, if we try to do an update and update it to have invalid information in, same sort of thing applies. If there's foreign key constraints, if we do an insert, there has to be something matching up to it in the other table. Same idea here. All right? We need that to be in the uh, uh, other table um, for an update as well as an insert. Deletes are sort of their own beast. All right? Uh, remember with deletes, we have a choice of cascading or restricting. So let's talk about that first from a database design perspective. All right. Um, the other thing I want to spend a minute talking about today is many-to-many uh, -many relationships. All right. Um, I keep coming up with a list. I keep saying there's two things to talk about, and by the time we're done, there'll be 20 things to talk about. But at any rate, delete statements. Uh, there's always the issue of foreign key relationships, and if that foreign key relationship 
involves a cascading delete or restrict. <coughs> there are other choices in other databases, but in Access, your choices are to cascade deletes or not. And when you create the foreign key, you see there's a little checkbox that says cascade deletes. Cascading updates um, are less important. Uh, generally speaking, you would uh, I would check that to cascade update. So like if you update the primary key field, should it go and update the rest of the things as well? And I would say generally speaking, yes, you would do that. You don't really run into that problem if you have uh, auto number keys because you can't update an auto number key. We'll take a look at this when we view this in Access. All right. In fact, let's go in and let's pull up a database. And we will look at these options. I was just thinking about it. Talking about these options probably isn't terribly meaningful. We need to actually look at them. Pull down the example that we've been looking at. Let's look at this database. We look at relationships. We have several foreign keys. We have foreign key between division and faculty, between faculty and, and section, between course and section. What do I mean by a foreign key? It means that field in one row, a, a, a field in one table points to a field in another table. Specifically, a field in one table points to a primary key of another table. That's used to accomplish a one-to-many relationship. So, one faculty ID can have many sections associated with it. But a given section only points to one faculty ID. So, this one-to-many is generated. Access knows that that's a one-to-many relationship. It's not like you have to like go in and tell it it's a one-to-many. It knows that this guy is not a primary key and does not have a unique index on it, and it points to a primary key. Therefore, logically, Access can conclude that this is a one-to-many relationship, and that's how it implements it. To establish a foreign key, <coughs> let's double click on the relationship to edit the relationship, you have to click Enforce Referential Integrity. If you don't click that, then it's really not a, a foreign key. Access will do some stuff with it, but it's really not a foreign key. Enforce Referential Integrity is exactly what we've talked about before. Whereas I can't have something in the section table that doesn't point to a valid faculty member. Now, cascade update, generally speaking, if you're using generated keys, you don't really need to worry about that. Um, I guess I would check it um, if I was not using generated keys. 
Cascade delete, though, you have to decide what's appropriate. All right? And your choices are to delete or to restrict. So let's go into the, the section table. I'm going to go into the section table. There's a foreign key on both, both course ID and faculty ID. That means I can't put in a faculty ID that doesn't exist. Something like that. And it won't complain about it right away until you try to save the data. All right. So right now, if I just go from field to field, I'm not trying to save the data. So notice that there's faculty now members 1, 2, 3, and 4. If I go in the section table and go and say that this is an internet section, when I go and switch rows is when it actually does the insert. And it tells me I cannot add or change a record because a related key, a related record is required in the table faculty. That's what it means to have a foreign key. That when I add a section, the faculty ID in this table has to match up with the faculty ID in that table. All right. I can't have a section that's taught by a faculty member that doesn't exist. Now this goes so far in helping to maintain the, the integrity of a database. All right. When I worked on systems that did not use relational databases, we had all sorts of these things that, that in database terms they call anomalies. We had orders without valid customers. That's horrible, right? If you have an order without a customer, who do you send the product to? Who do you send the bill to? You had orders without an, uh, with invalid items. Same thing. What did they buy? And so on. With relational databases, because you can set up these constraints, you can prohibit that from happening. All right? So it doesn't matter how we try to insert data into this database, we can't put it in unless the faculty member is valid. So I can click it. I can tab through it. I can enter it. I could write a mobile app that addresses this database. I could write a web app. I could write a desktop app. I could use PHP, I could use ASP.NET, I could do anything I wanted to. This database just won't let you put bad data in. And that's great for maintaining the integrity of the data. Because if the data is bad, the information you get from that data is not going to be good. It's going to be bad as well. Garbage in, garbage out. Right? So, this foreign key will force us to put in something that's valid. Now, that doesn't mean I could have typed in the wrong faculty ID, right? Okay, fine. But at least it's not a nonsense invalid. At some point, some faculty person will see I'm supposed to, supposed to teach this course and say, hey, that's not me, and it will get corrected, right? And it will only need corrected in one place. Now, that's as far as inserting a row in the database. Updating is the same thing. I can't go and update this to an invalid faculty number for the same reasons. So foreign keys for inserts and update, exact same thing. Now what about delete? Delete <coughs> when deleting, we're interested in, when we're talking about cascading and restricting deletes, we are interested from, uh, in the situation where we're deleting a parent, that is, we're deleting something from the one side of the relationship, what happens to the children? What happens to the fields on the other side? What happens to the rows on the other side of the relationship? So, I can delete a section, and there's no foreign key constraints that will cause me a problem, right? Because the section is the many side of the two relationships that it's involved in. So remember, the foreign key constraints come into play when you delete the when you delete from the entity on the one side of the relationship, not on the many side. 
So I could go in and delete a section. Doesn't matter. All right. Because that's not going to cause a foreign key validation. Essentially, the foreign key delete constraints relates to this. If I were to be able to delete a faculty member that has a section assigned to them, then I'd effectively be orphaning that section, right? I would have a section that pointed to an invalid faculty member. And that can't happen, right? It's a foreign key. You can't have a section point to a non-existent faculty member. We just saw that a minute ago when we tried to insert it or update it. <coughs> Same thing with deletions. We can't delete a faculty member and have sections still out there relating to them. So, our choices on the foreign key are to cascade or restrict. So, no to cascade means to restrict deletions. All right? So, if I look at the faculty table and the section table, there are sections out there for faculty ID 2. If I try to delete that faculty member, it'll tell me I can't do it. I can't do it because if I were able to delete this faculty member, then these, t these sections, these two sections here, would have a faculty ID of 2, and faculty ID 2 has been deleted from the faculty table. So effectively, that would orphan those sections. Those sections would point to a non-existent faculty member. All right? Now, the opposite of cascade is to, I'm sorry, the opposite of restrict is to cascade. What that means is, when I delete a faculty member, do I want to delete all the related rows to that faculty member? All right? Let's look at the relationship between course and division. course ID of 2. All right? Right now, the relationship between course and, and section is not to cascade. So that means I'm going to restrict. So if I restrict deleting that, I won't be able to delete it. All right? Because section 4 is for course number 2. So I can't delete course uh, 2 because there's a section associated with it. Unless I say cascade delete. And it won't let me do that because the, the table's already open. So let me close these tables. You'll notice that a lot, like if you're editing the table, you can't make structural changes to the database. And that kind of makes sense. Because if you're in the middle of editing it and you make structural changes, that could cause problems. So now I close those other tables and I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say cascade delete. All right? Now, what that means is if I go into course and I delete this course, notice that section 4 is for course ID of 2. If I delete that course, it warns me relationship that specify cascade deletes are about to cause one record in this table along with related records and related tables to be deleted. Are you sure you want to delete it? If I say yes, if I look at section, it's gone. 
Either way, it's not going to leave, no matter what, it's not going to leave a section with an invalid faculty number. Either you won't be able to delete the faculty number, or if you delete a faculty uh, member, it will delete the course. Uh, I'm sorry, it will delete the section. Same thing with course. It's not going to leave a, a section without a valid faculty number and without a valid course number. If you try to delete a faculty member and there are sections associated with it, your two choices are to delete all the sections associated with the faculty member or to not allow the deletion of the faculty member. Same thing with courses. Now, which one do you put in the database? It depends. That's a decision. <coughs> um, and you have to apply sort of some logic or some thought. And you have to know the problem that you're trying to solve. Let's imagine that a faculty person quit for another job. All right? And let's say they were deleted from the faculty table. All right? So it's spring semester's coming up, right? And we have our schedules, all right? Let's say I want the Powerball, all right? And I decide to quit, all right? And they deleted me from the database. Would they cancel all the classes that I teach? Probably not, right? What would they do? Well, they'd reassign them to other people, right? Maybe an adjunct or whatever, you know? They might hire five other people that could teach the load that I teach, right? Now, but they couldn't delete me until they did that, right? So for faculty people, I would suggest that we keep the restrict option on. Should be able to delete a faculty person if they're teaching classes. You should wait until those classes are reassigned. When they're reassigned, then you can go and delete the faculty person, all right? in this particular database. In other databases, you might not delete the faculty person even if they didn't have courses that they were assigned because you might need to keep them around for archival reasons. But in this particular, uh, this particular database, <clears throat> if you delete a faculty member, uh, they shouldn't have any courses assigned to them. But that doesn't mean we want to cancel the classes. Now think of the opposite side. If we get rid of a course. If we say CISS 243, for example, we're no longer going to teach at this college, all right, which uh, they would never do, of course, because it's a good course, but let's say they, were, they, they did that. Well, if they got rid of the course, then there's no sense having sections around for the course, right? If we decide we're not going to teach this course, we're not going to teach it. In that case, from course to section, might be a cascading delete. All right? So, you have to analyze the problem as a database designer and decide what makes more sense to cascade or to restrict. There's no, like, absolute guideline that you'd say, okay, always restrict, always cascade. Uh, sometimes people talk about uh, independent and dependent entities, like, uh, is a section dependent on a particular faculty member being there? No. Another faculty person could take over the course. All right? Does a section depend on the course being there? Well, yeah. If the course isn't there, there are no sections for it. So you kind of just logically figure out. But I can't say always do one or the other. You have to analyze it. You have to analyze the problem. And that will be one of the design decisions that you'll make when you design your database. All right. Um, what uh, what the relationship should be, and should you cascade deletes or not? Okay. Questions about this. I should hope this is largely review, but again, you 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 know, if if you've just had this in the one forty three class and you haven't talked about it or done much of it since then, it's good to review <coughs> this sort of stuff. So really, every relationship you should look at and decide whether it's cascaded or not. Now, getting back to our programming situation, that's something that could make a delete fail. 
all right? If we deleted something and there were related records to it, the delete might not work. All right. I talked about wanting to talk about many-to-many -many relationships. All right. We actually have a many-to-many -many relationship here. Even though you won't see a relationship that's labeled as many-to-many -many relationship. But the relationship between course and faculty is really a many-to-many -many relationship, right? One faculty person can teach many courses. A given course, not a given section, but a given course can be taught by many faculty members. So there's a many-to-many -many relationship. Now, here's the thing about many-to-many -many relationships. You can't implement them in a relational database. So you have to transform a many-to-many -many relationship to two one-to-many relationships using an intersecting table. And that's exactly what a section table is. It accomplishes resolving this many-to-many -many relationship to two one-to-many relationships. So. A section really is how we resolve the fact that there's a many-to-many -many relationship. Well, how do we know who teaches what? Well, you teach, if you teach a section of the class, then you teach that class. So we have a section that points to faculty and points to the course. Sometimes we could make that the primary key. Sometimes we could make something else like the section ID a primary key. It all depends on the table. In this case, a faculty member could teach multiple sections of the same course, in which case we couldn't make course ID and faculty ID the primary key. We have to make section ID the primary key. So, there's three kinds of relationships. There's one-to-one, -one, but those are rare. All right? You don't see any one-to-one -one relationships up here, right? Every one of them is at least a one-to-many relationship. You can't imagine a faculty, a division, that would only have one faculty member in it. All right? It doesn't make sense. The whole notion of a division is that you have a group of faculty people. So one-to-one -one relationships are relatively rare. The only one I think we could make is we could probably make a one-to-one -one relationship between division and dean. We could create a dean table. And then we could implement a relationship between dean and division. The way you do that is you link the two primary keys together as foreign keys. Or you create a field with a unique index and link it to a foreign key, uh, as a foreign key to the primary key of the other. But those are rare. Many-to-many -many relationships aren't rare, but they also get transformed into two one-to-many relationships. So chances are, when you're done, you're going to have, your relationships are all going to be one-to-many. Small chance you might have a one-to-one -one relationship somewhere in there. Remember also that... <coughs> A database needs to account for all instances of something, not just some. So, for example, the relationship between faculty and course. There may be some courses, yeah, that only one faculty person teaches them. But there are also some courses that multiple faculty members teach. So you can't say, well, it's most of the time a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many relationship, but sometimes a many-to-many. -many. Now, if it happens... You have to include that for that possibility. Okay. So, next thing we're going to talk about is the database update statements itself. The update and delete. We talked about the insert. We're going to talk about the update and the delete. Now, this is a case where I claim innocence because I'm not the one that invented these statements. All right. So when he asked me how come an update, all right. 
So don't blame me. I'm just explaining it to you. If you remember, an insert statement looks like this. Insert. Insert into table list of columns values list of values. All right. So let's make up a table. In fact, let's let's look at our division table, because we're going to play around with this table in a few minutes here, or, or maybe next time, depending on how, how time goes today. Our division table, we have three fields, a division ID, an abbreviation, and a full name. This is an auto number field. This is a string. This is a string. So our insert would look something like this. Insert into division Abbreviation, comma, full name, values, Something like that. We wouldn't use the division ID in there because that's an auto number field. And with an auto number field, that is automatically generated. Okay? So we don't have to put in an auto number field. In fact, we shouldn't put in an auto number field. Probably won't work if you put in an auto number field. So that's an insert statement. Now, as you noticed, that an individual insert statement only works on one table. All right. Now, there are some cases where we might want to insert into multiple tables. Guess what? We need multiple insert statements. There is something a little bit advanced in database technique called a transaction that we can create where we group up a set of database inserts, updates, and deletes into a unit. And the whole unit either succeeds or fails. But we're not talking about that right now. We're just going to do ones at, a ones at a time. So that's what an insert statement looks like. An update statement will look like this. Update set update, I'm sorry, table name, set, abbreviation, equals, This is 
assuming the division ID is 1 for this guy. That. This is the first row, so division ID equals 1. That's what an update statement looks like. Update, table, set. Then you have column equals value, comma, column equals value, comma, column equals value, comma. And then you probably have a where clause. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you don't have to update every column. All right? You don't have to update every column. My, your programs probably will update every column that is updatable. But you don't have to. I could write a update statement that only updated one column, for example. An example of that might be you might have a system where uh, you couldn't change your uh, user ID once you selected it. All right? So you wouldn't include the user ID or the user name, let's say. You can't change the user name after you've selected it. All right? So you might not be able to change the username after you select it. Therefore, you would not include the username in an update statement. All right? So you don't have to list all the fields here. All right? You just list the ones that you want to update. Actually, you don't need to update. You don't need to list all the fields in your insert statement either. Right? We already talked about the uh, order number fields get generated. Other fields, if they're not required, you don't have to include them. All right. So you could write an insert to insert three of the eight fields into a database table, provided that the other fields weren't required. All right. <coughs> now, what could go wrong with a delete with an update statement? Forgetting about basic syntax. All right. Obviously, I could get the syntax wrong. I could spell update wrong. I could put the wrong table name. I could put the wrong column name. I could forget to put quotes around things. Forgetting about those kinds of problems. What could go wrong with an update statement is if we try to update something that violates a database constraint. So, if we try to set the abbreviation to nothing, if that's required field, we'll get an error. All right, because we're trying to update something that violates the database rule. Another thing is if there were foreign keys involved. There's no foreign keys in this example. This is straightforward. All right. But in the case of the section table, there are foreign keys. All right. And if we try to insert something that had an invalid value for a foreign key, the update would fail, just like the update would fail on an insert if we tried to insert a value that was not, um, that did not relate to the foreign key. What's the purpose of the WHERE clause in an update statement? So I have select star from faculty, and I wanted to say where faculty ID equals one. All right? So if I do that, how many faculty people do I get? One. What if I omit that uh, where clause on the select star from faculty? Get all of them. So if I have a where clause on an 
update statement, and it says where faculty ID equal or division ID equals one. What am I going to update? Update that one row. What if I omit the where clause? What am I going to update? Yeah. All of them. All right. So yeah, it's kind of important to have a, a where clause on there because if you don't, you're going to update everything. All right. That's probably not what you want. In fact, in the kind of stuff that we're going to write, it's pretty safe to say that this is always going to be the primary key equals some parameter. That doesn't mean that you can't imagine a SQL statement where you would have a different work clause. Maybe I want to transfer all the Ohio customers to a certain sales rep. I could say update customer set sales rep ID equals five, where customer state equals Ohio. That's a legit statement, all right? And maybe if I was a DBA, I would write that statement if someone came up to me and says, hey, look, we're transferring all the, all the uh, um, sales reps from, uh, you know, or, or all the customers to this certain sales rep for Ohio. And you might write a program that will do that if that was something common. You know, getting back to our section problem, deleting a faculty person, we might have a page that allowed me to transfer sections to a different faculty person. So if I was a faculty person and they were trying to delete me, there might be something to say, okay, who should I transfer their courses to? Who's going to take over this guy's courses? And then I could do an update that way. But generally speaking, the kinds of things that we're doing is we're going to point to a faculty person and say, this is a guy that I'm going to update, and boom, update that one person. Or this is the division that we're going to update, and boom, we're going to update this one division. How do we guarantee that we update the one thing that we are interested in updating? How do we choose one row from a database? The primary key is how we uniquely identify a row. So. That where clause, most of the time, is going to be where primary key equals some value. Okay. What's next? The delete statement. Oh, it's not fair. The delete statement is the simplest. Delete from table where, again, what's the danger if we omit the where clause? It'll try to delete everything from that table. Notice I said it will try to delete everything. What would keep it from being able to delete everything? There's a foreign key constraint that restricted deletion. So in our table, we have a relationship between division and faculty. If we have restrict delete for that, I would not be able to delete a division if there are faculty members associated with it. Now these inserts, updates, and deletes are either going to completely succeed or completely fail. So if I erroneously had the delete statement to say delete from division, and had no where clause, if it couldn't delete one division, it would not delete any of them. All right? So it's not going to half do a statement. Likewise, if I said update division set something, blah, 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 and it matched more than one row, if it could not update all the rows, it would not update any of the rows. So SQL statements either completely succeed or completely fail. It's not like it's going to do part of the job. This is especially relevant when we are talking about um, 
deletions because deletions have the possibility of cascading delete. So if you imagine you have a table that has many foreign keys off of it, and you try to delete that table, if at anywhere down the line there's a restriction, it won't delete from any of the related tables. It's not like it will delete some of the tab from some of the tables and not from the others. It's literally going to be an all or nothing thing. It will delete everything that it's set out to delete, or it won't delete anything. Okay? If you think about that, it sort of makes sense. You know, we could think of examples like this. You know, um, in databases, a lot of times you want something to completely succeed or completely fail. This is sort of related to like if you have a transaction, if you have a bank transfer to transfer funds between your checking account and your savings account. You don't want that to half succeed, right? You don't want it to take it out of your savings until it's transferred in your, in your checking. If you can't update your checking account, you don't want it to take it out of your savings account either. All right? So you want that to either completely succeed or completely fail. Either one of those is okay, right? But what's not okay is to half do it. So if <coughs> the SQL statement allowed me to delete from, the, you know, to reduce, to take the money out of the, the check uh, savings account, and that succeeded, but it failed putting it in the checking account, you'd be out that much money because it would be out of your checking and didn't get put in your savings. If the reverse is true, then you just made some money and the bank is out some money. Well, neither of them are, are going to be a happy scenario for someone. All right? So if it can't do the transfer, if it can't do both halves of the transfer, it won't do any of the transfer. Right? And that's okay. You know, I may be a slightly disappointed I wasn't able to transfer the money from my checking to my savings, but at least it's not out any money. Right? At least it didn't take money out of my savings account and not put it somewhere. All right. So a lot of things in databases are like that, all right, where it completely succeeds or it completely fails. And, and that's a good thing. Okay, let's go and let's make this happen, all right, within uh, a database within our uh, app. And we're going to do this with a division table, as I promised. And I hope... Uh, I don't get crashes like I have been getting every other day in this class. If not, we got our plan, right? We'll go in and we will uh, custom write the code, all right? It's not fun, but at least it'll give us practice doing that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create A grid view that will allow us to update and delete items from a table. A grid view does not allow for inserts. All right. I'm going to go to my master page and add a link to maintain divisions.
edit my menu items. I'm going to add one. Oh, I didn't want that to be a child. I'll promote it. And I'll push it at the bottom. And I'll change that to division entry. And my URL will be division list. All right. So I'm going to go file new, file, create a web form, select master page, and I'll call this division list. And away we go. So I'm going to go and put on here a SQL data source. No, I grabbed the wrong one. SQL data source, not sitemap data source. And a grid view. save this just in case this blows up on me pick that connection string next Try one more time, then we'll go to plan B. Has anyone noticed, you know, has anyone developed any tricks to make this work? I look in the server explorer, and if it's not connected, like, go on view and get the server explorer up. And if it's not connected, then it'll freeze up. So, um, let's see, go to data connections and right click. And add, like, you re-add your connection, and then it'll plug that back in. That's what I've been doing. What do you mean re-add your connection like? Yeah, the, the uh, access database and then continue. And then I just add where my database is. Okay. Where, where 
are you seeing that? Right there, like on the uh, where it says college, you know, like the. Oh, the green there. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. And cross your fingers. Cross my fingers. There you go. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to pick the vision table. And I am going to pick all of these. I'm going to go to advance. And I'm going to say generate, insert, update, and delete statements. All right. Next, test the query, and finish. All right. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to bind those two together. And I'm going to run this, and looks like we did it. My division list. It's thinking about it. I like I like in a lot of some of the newer applications, they have amusing things that pop up while you're waiting for something that happens. You know, like I forget what the uh, one of the, the the, the snow sports one that I played, it's like, you know, snow is falling, uh, doing this, doing this. It's like, yeah, that's a nice touch. Okay, and there we go, and we have a list. Notice that we can't, you know I clicked generate, insert, update, delete, we can't do it. Why not? Because we have to sort of allow, tell the grid view that it's okay to do those operations. Remember, we got those two objects. And we have an object that does the database connectivity and the database operations. Then we have an object for the visual part of it. If we want to allow the update and delete of stuff from here, we have to get both of them set. So it's not enough for us to put the insert, update, and delete statements. We got those in here. If I look and do a view source, notice that I have the delete command. I have the insert command. I have this select command. And I have the update command. So the database knows how to update, the database object knows how to update, insert, delete. But we haven't told the grid view it's okay to do those things. <coughs> and if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because imagine the difference between a user page and an administrator's page. A user may be allowed to see certain things. An administrator could go in and change them. So the SQL class, the SQL component behind it, might know how to do all the inserts, updates, and deletes. But the UI class, the grid view, might allow us to programmatically set who can do the updates, who can do the deletes, and so on, based on certain parameters. So those two have to be in sync for us to be able to do updates and deletes. Right now, we're just going to make it so anyone could go and update and delete divisions. Probably not a good division or delete a division or whatever. But we're going to do that starting off. Later on, we might go and put some security in there to say, hey, only people that are logged on can go and make changes here. So how do I do that? I click on the grid view, and I say enable editing and enable deleting. 
All right. Enable editing and enable deleting. And notice what happened. We get little links for each row in the grid view saying edit and delete. All right. Let's go and look at the default behavior. Because whether you like the default behavior or not, I guess, let me put it this way. You're going to like some things about the default behavior. You're not going to like other things. All right? Because the default behavior is neat. It allows us to very easily create updates. However, the default behavior has some ugly aspects to it. Right? And we want to make sure that we can avoid those, that ugliness in our applications. The good news is, is we can custom code to change it. Right? We don't have to use a default behavior. We can write code to adapt our application to do what we want it to do. Again, what's the saying? It's a poor carpenter that blames a hammer. All right? It's not that ASP.NET did it this way. It's your application. If you don't like the default behavior of ASP.NET, then you write code to change it. So let's look at this. Let's go and run this now. If I go and run this, if I click edit here, I can go. Notice what happened. These things, let me hit cancel to show you what happened. They started out as being labels in that table. I hit edit, and they become text boxes. Actually, these two things become text boxes. The division ID doesn't become a text box. Why? Because you can't update a primary key. That's why, again, updating, uh, updating um, uh, cascading updates is generally something I don't worry about too much because the default behavior is to prohibit updating of primary keys. So. Let's say I want to change that from saying information technology to IT. So I'll go and change it to IT. And I click update. Boom, it changed it. Pretty nice, huh? I didn't have to write any code. I went, I put in my select. I didn't even put in a select. I manually selected what fields I wanted. And then I clicked to generate the updates and deletes. All right. What about deletes? I can delete that. It's gone. All right. Wow. <laughs> uh, seems pretty brutal, right? What if I edit this and I blank out the abbreviation or the full name and click update? Ooh, it allowed me to do that. All right probably because I didn't put constraints in there. Let's look at the database and make some changes in it. All right, let's look at what the database says for that. This might be a case where I didn't go in and put those constraints in. Yeah, abbreviation should be required. And full name should be required. And as far as relationships go, I am thinking if I delete a division, I don't want to get rid of all the faculty. All right. It's a good thing that they did that, right? Because we got rid of the business division and merged us with engineering. If there was a cascade delete in our database, I would have disappeared when they got rid of the business division, right? So instead, we're going to put a restrict deletion on that. All right. So now our database is more the way I want it to be. So now I go in, if I try and edit this, 
update it, boom, I get an ugly error. All right. And it didn't update it. All right. If I try to delete it, boom, I get an ugly error. Okay, so this is a classic good news, bad news scenario. All right, let's go back and try to delete Arts and Humanities. Oh. Let's go put another division in that there isn't any faculty for. Now this, because there's no faculty associated with that division, I should be able to delete it. And sure enough, that's the case. I can delete it. So let's, all, let's talk about all the things we don't like about this. All right? Number one, it allows me to edit things and it doesn't do any validation. All right? It... Uh, I can go and I can get rid of fields and try to do an update. I get a big old ugly database there. That's one thing I don't like about it. Second thing I don't like about it is if I try to delete something and there's related rows, it gives me an error. And it gives me a big old ugly database error. The third thing I don't like about it is if I can delete something, it makes it disappear immediately. Doesn't give me a chance to say, hey, wait a minute, did I want to do that? All right? So we're going to address these problems one at a time, starting this Thursday. <laughs> I just looked at the time. It's, it's 11.29. I always like to give the cliffhanger, right? Take it right up to the, to the edge and say, tune in next time to see how we're going to get around these problems. But this is a classic case of, the developer behavior is great, right? It does stuff that we don't have to, you know, we did that in like five minutes, you know. But <coughs> the bad news is that the default behavior handles it in a very clunky way. And there's ways that we can do a better job uh, by spending forth a little bit of effort. We can make it work exactly the way that we want it to. And that's what we'll address next time. All right. I'll go unlock lab. I'll come back here to gather my files, then I will uh, be over in line.